Larry Elder, it's wonderful to have you back on American Thought Leaders. Well, thank you so much for having me back. I guess I didn't blow it too badly last time, otherwise you wouldn't have me back. So. Right, right. Thank you. <laughs> but so, you know, speaking of laughter, we're, we're starting a new show with you, and, and I'm very, very excited about this. Well, so am I. I think we've done, I think, about eight of them now, and they're timely topics, about 10 minutes or so along, and um, so far, so good. Yeah, so, I, you know, I was, I was just looking at the last one, um, you know, basically talking about the racist police myth. This is one you know, kind of a, always seems to be coming up in the media, but you somehow are able to offer some solid facts that we yeah. actually need to yeah, hear. Yeah. Ima imagine that, facts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the, uh, the videos, the one you're talking about, we talked about the assertion made by people like Colin Kaepernick uh, that uh, the police are institutionally, systematically engaging in racial profiling. Unfortunately for Mr. Kaepernick, fortunately for our society, it's not true. Uh, it's been studied and, and there is no pattern. It's not to say that there aren't bad cops, obviously. In a country of 330 million people, there are going to be some, uh, some morons. But the idea that the police are routinely, uh, in some sort of institutional way, going after black people just is not borne out by the data. One, just one or two uh, examples. Uh, most people don't know that the DOJ conducts something called the Police public contact survey, e survey every three years. Okay. They interview 60,000 Americans, 60,000, right. and they ask them, have you had a, a, an interaction with the police last year? And if you did, what is your race? What is your age? Uh, what is your gender? How was your contact? Was there, was there violence? Was there uh, uh, bad language? Right. And they tabulate all of this, and for all these years they've been doing this, they can't find any sort of pattern of bad behavior on the part of cops against black people. Um, another uh, uh, black... Uh, economist with uh, Harvard, his name is Roland Fryer, okay. and he decided that he would study the uh, disproportionate amount of deadly force used against black people. He assumed that was going to be his conclusion. He said, when I did the research, it was the most stunning finding in my entire career. I could not find uh, any pattern of, of deadly force used against black people disproportionately. If anything, the police were more hesitant more reluctant to pull the trigger against a black person than a white person. And the why uh, is probably because the police are deathly afraid of being accused of, of racism. Right. They'll become public figures, may lose their pension, may go to jail. And so if anything, the police are pulling back regarding black suspects. So it's not even true. Moreover, it's getting people killed. Right. Uh, in, uh, in Ferguson, where the, the uh, uh, Michael Brown allegedly had his hands up, don't shoot, turns out to be a complete lie. Uh, because the police in Ferguson and nearby Cincinnati, uh, St. Louis, outside of Ferguson, were so afraid of being called racist, they began to pull back. Crime went up. Chicago, there was a, a shooting. Uh, the police were accused of being uh, a, a racist. And the mayor of uh, Chicago, Rahm, Rahm Emanuel at the time, said the police have become so intimidated, they have, quote, balled themselves up into a fetal position, close quote, and they're not fighting crime. As a result, crime's gone up. Baltimore, where Freddie Gray died, who died in right. the van. Um, Baltimore City is about 45% black. The mayor at the time of uh, Freddie Gray's death was a black female. Uh, the number one and number two heads of the police department were black. All the city council is a Democrat, majority black. The state attorney brought the charges against the six officers uh, black. Three of the six officers black. The judge before whom two of the cases were tried black. And at the time, the United States Attorney General was black and the U.S. President was black. And we're talking about Institutional racism? Isn't this a little insane, at least when it comes to Baltimore? So that's what, I, that's what I've argued. And look, if you look at on all these cases, whether it's uh, Freddie Gray or Michael Brown or Eric Gardner in New York or Tamir Rice in Cleveland, in almost 100% of these cases, if the suspect or civilian followed instructions, we'd have a different conversation. My right. father always told me, when you drive, Larry, and you're pulled over, make sure your left hand's at 2, 10 o'clock, your right hand is at 2 o'clock. Say yes, sir. Say no, sir. Make sure your paperwork is in order. And if the officer does something or says something you think is inappropriate, get a badge number, and you and I can deal with it while we're both alive. Right. Why the so-called civil rights leaders don't tell people to do that? And then a lot of these instances would never happen. And then we can deal with the bad ones on a case-by-case -case basis. That's what these so-called leaders ought to be telling people, but they're not. They're telling black people, you're victims of institutional, systemic, structural racism, and the data are not there. And as a result, people have an attitude that's causing them not to invest in themselves the way they would be if they believe in themselves and believe in the country. So you're hurting the very people that you claim you're helping. 
So Larry, you know, you're a fountain of information. I think you must have a photographic memory. Um, <laughs> the, no, but the incredible thing is with the Larry Elder Show on the Epic Times, you actually managed to deliver some of this really important information, but actually do it with a bit of humor, which is tough, because these are tough <laughs> issues, right? Well, if you take everything so seriously, you're going to explode. So no, I, I try to, and, and, and that's how I see life, too. I don't take it all that seriously. All you have to do is work hard in America, and you'll be fine for crying out loud. We hit the lottery when we were born here, and you hit the lottery, in my case, when I had mother and father who stayed together and worked to make sure that my brothers and I had the right kinds of values. So what do I have to complain about? I, I, would, I would be insulting the black men and women who labored throughout this country during times that were horrific times. When I was born, it was just uh, five years earlier that Jackie Robinson was allowed to play in the major leagues. When I was born, uh, there were still 13 states in America where a black person and a white person couldn't marry. Right. Uh, this was before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This was before the Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and for me to, to look at what's happened to the country and, and, and fast forward, Barack Obama gets elected and reelected. MLK, Martin Luther King, in the mid 60s gave a talk. And he said, I'm amazed at how much racial progress there has been. This is in the 60s he said this. He said in about 40 years time, there could be a black person elected president. It happened almost precisely when he said, and the okay. reason that was the goal was because that tells you something about America. If a black person can be elected in a majority white country, it means that racism is no longer a major problem in America. That's what MLK meant when he said, in, in 40 years time, there could be a black president. There has been, and what do we get? We get Obama who went from not being on the same building with Al Sharpton to his second term, inviting him to the White House over 70 times. And Obama said to America, racism is in America's DNA. Jan, if racism were in America's DNA, the man never could have gotten elected because in the 1950s, when the question was asked of white people, would you ever elect a black person irrespective of how qualified he is? They said no. So if it's in our DNA, how can he get elected? This is a very different country than, than right. your grandfather's country. And for people like Obama and the other so-called leadership to be telling black people that you're a victim, uh, to me, is a, is a crime. If leadership malpractice were, were a crime, these guys would be on death row. Wow. So, you know, Larry, you came here to Western Conservative Summit to talk about, you know, another issue that's very important to you, which is religious liberty, right. basically, and the encroachment on that, mm -hmm. more specifically. Uh, tell me a little bit about what's on your mind right now. Yeah. I, I just ran into Jack Phillips. Jack Phillips is the owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop here right. in Colorado. And a gay couple came in and demanded that he make a cake for a gay wedding. Because of his religious convictions, he refused. The thing went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Now, this is the, these are the same group of people on the left who have no problem with Sarah Sanders being hectored out of a restaurant or a restaurateur coming up to a Trump aide and saying, I don't feel comfortable with you being in my shop. These are the same people that cheer that. But a couple can come into a, uh, a man's shop who has religious convictions and demand that he make a cake for a wedding that he does not support. And the left feels that he's the fascist, he's a Nazi, but cheering people that throw out Trump aides out of their restaurant. They've gone crazy. They've actually gone crazy. I call it Trump derangement syndrome. Um, and how do we get to the point where if you believe in God, there's something wrong with you? Mayor Pete Buttigieg is learning that uh, the left is very uncomfortable with people on his side uh, who invoke religion. I think it's one of the reasons he's not doing well. Um, the country's values are under assault. When you hear this over and over again, this mantra, Jan, diversity is our strength. Nonsense. Thomas Sowell said, our strength is overcoming the problems inherent in diversity. Right. Because when people look alike, uh, look different, think different, uh, worship different gods, there's inherent friction there. And for us, because we believe uh, in the Judeo-Christian values that founded this country, for us to have that central belief, therefore means that we can overcome the differences that we all have uh, of our races and, and, our, and our histories and our background. So the idea that diversity is in and of itself good soup is BS. It, it, it is in, in and of itself fragile soup. But because of America, because of liberty, because of the belief in our Constitution, because of Article 1, Section 8, which most Americans used to believe in, that's the glue that holds this country together, and I'm afraid it's falling apart. 
So now that, that's actually fa fascinating, genuinely, because you're saying diversity, yeah, of course there's going to be a tons of diversity, but the thing that makes America special is the ability to overcome the problems that Inherent, diversity inherently that's right. gives. That's right. That's Tom, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I remember, I, saw you, I think I saw you tweet that mm -hmm. a little while right. ago, mm -hmm. and I thought, wow, that's a, that, that's a powerful thought. Mm -hmm. So what, are, what can we be doing to, to keep can, overcoming? We can emphasize what made this country great, why this country was founded, founded based upon a notion uh, that government governs through the consent of the governed. No country in history has ever been founded on that principle. Right. Um, and for people to be born and raised here and take that for granted uh, is, uh, is, a, is a real crime. And now you have a situation where more Democrats believe in socialism than they believe in capitalism. This is scary. I've never seen anything like this. Who would have thought two years after the election and re-election of the first black president, we'd be having a serious conversation about reparations. Are you kidding me? Slavery ended 150 years ago. Reparations could, in my opinion, be properly called the extraction of money from people who were never slave owners to be given to people who were never slaves. It is ridiculous. Only about 5% of white people have any generational connection to slavery whatsoever. Even during slavery, only about 5% of people in the South owned slaves, so most people never did. 350,000 people lost their lives on the Union side, and another quarter of a million were, were injured. So you're talking about almost 600,000 people who either lost their lives or were severely injured uh, in a war that ultimately freed blacks. Should their descendants pay reparations? It's absurd. And Mitch McConnell just the other day said, uh, when he was informed that there are slaves in his ancestors, he said, well, I, I uh, find myself in the same position as, uh, as President Barack Obama. Both of us oppose reparations, and both of us uh, have ancestors who own slaves. And he was referring to the fact that Obama's mom, on her side, apparently owned slaves. So that's a, that's a problem, isn't it? Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris's father is from Jamaica. Right. Her mother is from India. Kamala Harris's father has admitted that his family owned slaves. So does Kamala Harris cut a check? Does she receive a check? Does Obama cut a check? Does he receive a check? It is ridiculous. Why don't we embrace the opportunities that we have right now. There was a poll in 1997 done by Time and CNN. They asked black teens and white teens the following question. Is racism a major problem in America? And both said yes. More white teens, by the way, said yes than black teens did. But then they asked this of the black teens. Is racism a big problem, a minor problem, or no problem in your own daily life? 89% of black teenagers, this is 1997 now, okay. said that racism was either no problem or a minor problem in their own daily lives. In fact, more black teens than white teens said yes to the following proposition. Failure to take advantage of opportunities is a bigger problem than racism. More black teens said yes to that than white teens did. That was 1997. Come on, it's 2019 now. Grow up, knock it off. Work hard, invest in yourself, you'll be just fine in America. You know, it, it's, it's so interesting, this reparation question. It actually has been on my mind because I feel, you know, Black Americans have been treated horribly in the past, obviously, in, in this country. And I, and I, I feel, I don't know, I don't feel personally responsible. Obviously, my, my parents are Polish immigrants, right? Yeah. But, um, but, but I do feel that a horrible wrong has been done. You're basically saying, well, the Civil War, if anything, kind of paid the debt, the Civil War did because of the number of deaths. Well, well, and we don't need to look at that anymore, and it's just kind of a political ploy or something, well, right? Well, that's right, but, but not just the Civil War. I mean, my goodness, we've had 50, 60 years of, of race-based preferences, lowering standards to admit uh, people of color into colleges and universities. We had this um, Community Reinvestment Act, which was passed in the 70s and given teeth in the 90s. And essentially, what it did is pressure banks to lower their lending standards so that more black and brown borrowers could buy homes, who otherwise would not have qualified for a home in years past. It was a bad policy, but, but, the, but the intent was to broaden home ownership for minorities. It's what gave us the housing meltdown, and from 2010 to 2013, black net worth fell 25%, largely because a bunch of black people had homes that they otherwise wouldn't have qualified for, were induced into getting, and it turned out to be bad policy. Race, uh, uh, the welfare state. When Lyndon Johnson launched the war on poverty in 1965, that was largely uh, to make up for historical wrongs for black people. 
What did it do? It incentivized women to marry the government and allowed men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. And as a result, we've gone from having 25% of black kids born outside of wedlock in 1965 now to 70% in 2019. So all these things, you could call them reparations in, in a way. Right. You add them all up, and they were really designed to help black people. They had the counter effect, but that wasn't the intent. So the idea that America has not tried to make up for historical wrongs is simply not true. Of course they have. It just, it, it seems to have had almost the opposite effect. I think that's what And I want to say right? one more thing, too, yeah. about, about slavery. The slaves that came to America were slaves. They would have been slaves in Africa. In fact, more slaves remained in Africa and served masters who were black in Africa than were taken out of Africa by European slavers uh, and by Arab slavers combined. So the blacks who, who came to America were not going to have a good time anyway. They were already... Uh, uh, conquered in, in, uh, in war. They were already going to be slaves. The only question is what location? And when you look at the European slave trade, there must have been about 12 million blacks taken out of Africa. The estimate is about 10 million survived, about a, t a 5 to 20 percent rate of attrition. The Arab slave trade began centuries earlier, kept going when the European slave trade ended, and the rate of attrition for those that were transported often on foot through the Sahara, was almost 90%. No one talks about the Arab role in the, in the slave trade. So, and the Europeans were the first ones, the Western culture anyway, to have a revulsion against it. Uh, so the idea that the West owes these kinds of reparations, when you ignore the fact that, that these were African chieftains who conquered these blacks um, in war, they were going to be slaves no matter where they would have been, uh, sh seems to me should be taken into consideration. Fascinating. No, I, I actually haven't heard this perspective before, and, and thank you, because this, this has been coming up in American Thought Leaders' interviews, because I, I've, I've had all sorts of mixed feelings about it, because if, I do feel it's been such a, right. such a wrong. The slave very, trade yeah. could, not have, could, not have, could not have occurred but for the complicity of black African chieftains. White uh, Europeans had no immunity to the diseases they would have gotten if they'd gone into the interior. And the big myth about slavery... Uh, stems, in my opinion, from that okay. otherwise good movie called Roots, which aired in the 1970s. Kunta Kinte was the protagonist, and in Roots, he's walking down the jungle, and some uh, white guys with nets jump him and take him away. Can you think about that, how inefficient that would have been to catch him one at a time like that? They were sold in mass by African chieftains. Uh, and um, right. if we're going to demand reparations from, from America... Do we then go to, the, go to Africa and, and get uh, paid from, from them, and then go to the Arab countries and get paid from them? It's ridiculous. Let's just move on. Slavery existed in the, in the world from the beginning of time. Asians enslaved Asians. The word slave came from Slavic. Caucasians enslaved, uh, enslaved uh, uh, Caucasians. Muslims enslaved Caucasians. Native Americans enslaved Native Americans. There were even Native Americans who owned slaves. There were even blacks who owned slaves in America. Not very many. But at the time of 1860, there were roughly 500,000 free blacks in this country. Half lived in the north, half lived in the south. Of those who lived in slave states, 4,000 owned slaves, about 20,000 slaves. The percentage of blacks who owned slaves was much smaller than the percentage of whites it did, don't get me wrong. But nobody has clean hands in this deal. Nobody right. does. Very, super interesting. So, Larry, uh, any final words uh, here before we finish up? I would like to tell everybody in this country, no matter your race, no matter your gender, no matter your sexual orientation, if you work hard in America and invest in yourself uh, and don't make bad moral mistakes, you will be just fine. There's a reason that all these people in the, in the world are coming over here, sometimes from Cuba, fighting shark-infested waters to get here, because this is the greatest country uh, that God ever created, and we ought to embrace it uh, and not lose the values that made this country great. We've got a country to save, and it's our obligation to make sure that we save it. Powerful message. Thank you. And Larry, you know, tell me a little bit, let, let's finish up talking about your show, because I want to get people oh. liking and subscribing and going there. Well, uh, So what can they expect next from you? Um, well, my next one is probably going to be um, Donald Trump Jr. retweeted a tweet that was put out by a black guy named Ali. And Ali questioned whether Kamala Harris was, quote, an African-American, close okay. quote. So Donald Trump Jr. Tweet, retweeted it. He didn't put it out. He retweeted it. He got hammered. He took it down. But uh, back in, I think, January or February, Don Lemon was talking to somebody on his show, Don Lemon, the, the uh, anchor on CNN. Right. 
and he was questioning why Kamala Harris referred to herself as an African American. He said, her father is from Jamaica. Jamaica is not America. She is black, not an African American. Don Lemon said that. Uh, Chris Matthews on MSNBC uh, a month earlier had a guest on, black. Chris Matthews is white. And said to the guest, is Kamala Harris seen as an African American, close quote? And the answer was more interesting to me than the question. The answer was, well, she went to Howard. Right. White, there's some white students at Howard. <laughs> And she, she uh, has planted herself firmly in the African-American community, close quote, this black guest said. Well, Rachel Dolezal uh, went to Howard and planted herself firmly in the African-American community. How come she isn't black? Right. Um, so you have these two people questioning it. Uh, and, but when Donald Trump retweeted that, he's now a racist. What is Donald, what's, Donald, what's, what's Don Lemon then? What is he? The, the fact is, a number of people have questioned what Kamala Harris uh, should be called, what she calls herself. There was an interview in 2008 when she ran for Senate. And the man says to her, uh, you'll be the first Indian senator because her mom is from India. And she said, knock wood. She didn't say, well, I'm also this, I'm also that. She said, knock wood. So she herself so she agreed. responded. Yeah, yeah, she agreed yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah. So how is poor Donald Trump Jr. supposed to figure it out? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to get this You're gonna get with this. a healthy dose of humor. You got it. Larry Elder. You got it. Larry, thank you so much. My pleasure, Wonderful John. having you again.